modules on SGI's MPI, what is often referred to as MPT. It's called Message Passing Toolkit because there are other things in the package, in the RPM, including the Shemem library. And in the past, there were a few other things like uh, PVM and the Arena. They just called it a Message Passing Toolkit. Again, what we want to do here is run an MPI application. I have this code, code 6. We want to use top and PS to see the threads and what they're doing. I want to look at barrier synchronization and fault cache sharing. Uh, if I get time, I'll install the Intel MPI library and do a, fault, uh, do a barrier synchronization problem there. I want to identify what an MPI application looks like. Use MPI environment variables to optimize the application and debug it. And I'm skipping over P threads. So MPI, message passing interface, is a library called standard. It was uh, standardized through the industry and academia. It's contained in the message passing toolkit. Key thing here is you have to rewrite your code, rethink your whole problem, a lot of hours. You, you now have to break up the data, focus on data flow and data locality, decompose the data into messages and pass the message off to the other ranks or processes as a part of the MPI application. Advantage of MPI, it is cluster or SMP aware. So I can start with Shemem and then move into uh, NumaLink or TCP, InfiniBand, things of that sort. Now, with SGI's MPT, it will automatically figure out the best interconnect to use. Really not the subject of this class, but there's something called DAPL, Direct Access Provider Layer, where a program or an application can pull, uh, ask the OS what type of transports or fabric software layers I can connect and use, something called RDMA and VERBS. But MPI is not using that. Last I checked, MPI is still reducing latency and bypassing the kernel and doing what's called socket direct protocol instead of RDMA. This bypasses everything from the network interface going into the kernel slab and puts it straight into user space. This also avoids a copy, memory to memory copy, which reduces our latency. Now, if I spawn my work, I could actually have all four types here, but generally ECP is going to be terrible for latency. Shared memory is going to be your best for latency. And then NumaLink versus InfiniBand are kind of close to each other on latency. Of course, NumaLink is proprietary and a little bit more pricey compared to InfiniBand that's an open source product. Now, if I spawn my work across the cluster, I could uh, end up with nodes or threads that are on the same node, and they would use shared memory and find the best interconnect without using the direct access provider layer or DAPL. And then it might be between partitions. I'd like to do that here and use NumaLink. And I might use NumaLink across my partitions, and then they might use Shemin between each other. And if I got systems that are InfiniBand but not NumaLink, then I could find the InfiniBand one. Each thread is a completely separate process in PF. Again, this is using shared memory to pass messages, or it could be on a different machine and a network socket connection between them. If I'm using it with different partitions, I need to load this XPC module. That will also get me into trouble because XPC, first of all, has to be the same kernel module on all the partitions. If it's not, if I accidentally upgrade foundation on one of the partitions but not the other, it will panic on boot, saying that another partition has a different checksum for their XPC. Then you have to drop into rescue mode to try to take that XPC module out of the ITSI sysconfig kernel file. So that's one problem, putting XPC in there. The other problem, XPC has a heartbeat to it. So you can have a constant heartbeat between the partitions. And for me, I've got 
typically four partitions, but in this case three. If partition two were to get sluggish or have a load problem, the heartbeat demon on that partition might impact me, and the partitions higher than the struggling partition might start getting XPC heartbeat problems and disconnects. So that's the other problem. I have had cases where four students on four different partitions, but partition three has something wrong with it, doesn't have XPC loaded or whatever, they're not coherent, and then the higher partitions above the struggling partition are basically unusable. And then I try to reboot, it's fine on boot, and then all of a sudden the heartbeat kicks in and it's unusable again. Now I happened to catch this with top once and I saw an XPC underscore heartbeat running. So that XPC can give me cross partition MPI, but the side effects could be a problem too if things are out of sync or if they're if I drop into KDB on partition two, everything above it is going to have a problem. It depends upon that heartbeat between the partitions. Also in loading XPC, you really need to have all the partitions booted coherently. There is a known timing problem in the order of loading XPC that could cause it to fail as well. When I do get into cross-partition problems, when I configure XPC, I try to boot all partitions sequentially or in, at the same time concurrently, and then check to see that uh, MPI is working between the partitions. I don't know that I'll have time today to do that, but tomorrow I'd like to do that and get cross-partition MPI working. Let's see how far we can get today. Different flavors. Now, SGI's MPT was based upon Cray. This is actually before the most common flavor of MPI called MPitch. My memory and background had SGI's MPT coming off of, 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 basically, I remember Edinburgh University being the source that they started MPT from. And this was, you know, as flavors of MPI were being developed. The most common MPI is MPitch. MPitch came from Argon Labs in Illinois, the Fermi Labs, Argon. That then became picked up as an open source original MPI that then got implemented with Intel's MPI, Voltaire and Scali, uh, HP, MVAPitch, and the IBM MPI. So most of these flavors of MPI were built upon MPitch. There was a second flavor occurring at the same time as MPitch and SGI's, or I should say at the time, Cray's MPI, the Los Alamos MPI, or LAM MPI, which became Open MPI. So we have three basic starts, the MPT, the MPitch, and the LAM MPI. So this is rather a simplistic MPI example just a hello world type of thing. I don't even know that this will compile for sure. I'm just trying to get it to fit on the page. I first of all have to have the MPT kernel or the MPT user module loaded to get my path to this. Now in older releases of Performance Suite and ProPack, the SGI's MPI was put in user bin and you did not have to include it. It was always there but then you start getting collisions with other flavors of MPI. So they moved SGI's MPT from slash bin and user lib off to the slash opt SGI directory. So when I've got it properly, the, the user module MPT loaded, I can find the includes for it. Now all I'm gonna do is have a buffer for hello world. I have to figure out what order my particular thread was spawned in, how many ranks were spawned, and I've got an index counter and a status field. Now when I run this program, I'm going to do an MPI run dash NP with the number of threads, like 32. So when I do the MPI run, the MPI init is going to see the 32 and spawn off 32 threads. So after MPI init is done, each of those ranks or threads are going to have the arguments that were passed into this thing available to them. 
and right after the MPI init, each thread then figures out, okay, how many threads were spawn, or which rank am I, and how many ranks were spawned. And I kind of use thread and rank and processes interchangeably. Now this is a master-slave concept, so if my rank was zero, if I'm the master thread, then I'm going to copy hello world into the message buffer, and then for each of the ranks that I have, decrement through them until I hit the number of ranks on the system, and send each of the other ranks or threads I spawn in MPI send and send it the message. Length of the message, type of message, and send it to the world. Now this is a blocking call, meaning that the send will sit there and wait until the thread that it's sending to comes back with the receive. It has to respond to it. So this is known as a blocking. We will go to sleep waiting on that send. Now, if my rank is not zero, then I am a slave, and I will go into a receive waiting for the send to come in. So when the receive sees that message, it's going to write into there and then just print it out. And then when everything is done, the MPI init has to be closed with an MPI finalize. So that's a simplistic example. Now, each MPI thread or rank is a separate process. Dash NP determines on how many threads or ranks you're going to spawn. You don't want that to be more than the CPU is available to you in your CPU set. Now, I'm going to have to configure array D to do this stuff. And there's an authentication file to say whether I can do it across uh, hosts or not. So by default, there's no remote and it only can run Shemem. Now there's a daemon called Array D. On other flavors of MPI, the equivalent of that thing was called MPD. MPD came out of the M pitch. Now this purpose of this daemon is to stay up and running all the time. So it's listening on a network socket and this reduces latency in thread startup. MPD has been replaced now in Intel MPI with uh, I MPI, it is now called Hydra. So the MPD daemon is gone, and now we have a Hydra thing that is doing the spawning of the thread. Hydra scales better than the older MPD daemon. So if you are in a 4.0 type of Intel MPI, you need to start flipping to the Hydra spawner instead of the MPD spawner. And I had a site last summer that had severe scaling problems. Oh, where were they? I think they were in like the uh, 900 rank count. And, and Intel MPI was having trouble spawning and cleaning up processes when they were done. And Hydra did not have that problem. So SGI's version of that same daemon is called Array D. Now, one thing I, personal opinion, with Intel MPI, this MPD or Hydra, it's up to the user and the job to start up this uh, daemon that is talking between all the hosts for communication. And sometimes jobs get aborted. The what's called a token ring doesn't get cleaned up. Some MPD demons might still be running, and then the next time you try to run, leaving it up to the application to start up this demon token ring that talks across all the hosts can be unreliable. With SGI's MPT, it's not up to the application. There's only one demon running. If I had Intel MPI and two jobs, two MPI apps on the same host, there would be two MPD demons running. So here we just have one master one completely controlled by root. We don't have to worry about the application spawning and starting this communication token ring between the hosts. So Array D has a lot of advantages over the uh, MPD daemon or the Hydra stuff. Now to watch this cluster, we do have a cluster viz, and I'm going to use PMG cluster when I get to it. And there's an itsy nose file that specifies what nodes I want to look at. In fact, I had already set that up earlier in the week 
when I was using PMG cluster. So I'm going to take a program, NPI run, number threads two, PS run, and then a dash F to follow forks. And then when I did my PS processes on it, in this case, I'm seeing mem copy at the top of the list. That's not so good, memory to memory transfers. I'm also seeing barrier synchronization. MPI, SGI, shared progress is what a stuck barrier looks like with MPT. Now we were seeing with Intel MPI the SCED yields and the KMP underscore sleep weight, uh, contact switching, all that sort of stuff. That's what Intel barrier synchronization looks like. Now SGI's MPT is a spin barrier. So you'll have 100% CPU time, but if you attach to something, you'll see it in MPI, SGI, shared progress. The other thing of concern to me here, though, is mem copy. Let me share my whiteboard here. So the concept here is I've got a process here. I've got a process here. They want to talk to each other. Now, there is kind of an assumption. We don't know what is between them. It could be a network interface. So what they do is they have two IO or two data buffers here that the data is going through. And that is three mem copies. And any memory-to-memory -memory transfer is going to chew away at your bandwidth going to take longer if the interconnect is busy. It's going to take longer if I am doing double copies. So there's what's known as a single copy. I'm going to get to this in demo. If I can do single copies, I can remove one of these buffers, basically, and then only have one, two, instead of three shuffling around of my memory. So that mem copy, when I see that, I start worrying about whether I'm getting single copy transfers or not. Let's move on. I also, by the way, am seeing the GRU involved in here. There are some known problems with the GRU right now. The next release of MPT has several fixes to it and is being tested at NASA Ames this week right now. They just grabbed the latest yesterday. So that GRU is being used for inter-process communication, what's called the MPI offload engine, the MOE, and it's using hardware support in the harp, in the shub, to communicate between ranks without going through memory. And only SGI's MPT can use the GRU. Intel's, in, Intel's MPI has no knowledge, no routines to call the global reference unit. So you got to watch for both of those things. Let me move on. So there is a man page, man to MPI. I always hated Intel MPI because they don't have man pages for things. You have to bring up the PDF. I'm kind of used to having a man page right on my system. So what do we got here? We can get stats. We can put the statistics in a file, turn on verbose or turn on verbose 2, and there are a couple other verbosities in here for troubleshooting in particular. So when I do the MPI stats, I'm going to get this thing here, 3 colon, comes from this prefix right here. So when I do the dash prefix, it will print the rank number. Note I got a colon in here too. So I get the rank number colon and then whatever was printed out by that particular thread. And what we want is no retries. But look at also, we don't have any single copy transfers going on. Everything is using shared memory, by the way. And we got two types of calls. Point-to-point -point calls are like send and receive, and then we have collective calls, which are like broadcast and reduce, different types of routines to do uh, consolidation and communication between the other ranks. So 
there are a couple of useful things here. First of all, in debugging, these are commonly being used right here to debug things. So there are potential problems. We've got a site we're doing a mem map off, which is basically turning off XP mem. And then the way memory mapping between the threads works changes. The other one is when to use the GRU. So do I want to use the GRU on the same socket or the same blade or uh, on the same partition or between partitions? The GRU was kind of meant more for going from rack one to rack 100 than it is from going from uh, on the same node from one address to a, a new location on that same node. I'm not sure there's going to be a real payoff when you're down to a small system, the GRU is a better payoff on a large system, particularly cross-partition. Those three things are often uh, used to disable the GRU, disable XPMEM, and try to get its behavior uh, more generic like an Intel MPI does without using SGI-specific features. Also, and I wasn't seeing this work last week, I'm going to see what happens this week. This determines above which I do single copy transfers. So what's the maximum size of the buffer before I do single copies? And this is the one that did not seem to work for me last week. Being able to do, do DMA coming out of the GRU and get full bandwidth. Single copy transfer is going to increase my bandwidth. The other one here are the number of buffers per proc or buffs per host. This is for retries. If I'm having to keep retry because I'm in a memory shortage situation, I can increase these. If it's cross, if it's between hosts, that one. If it's on the same host, this one. Now there are some other ones in here. I'm not going to use any of those. So the key ones in the stats file, I want the buffs per host and buffs per proc, and then the buffer max. Now, I'm not going to do anything in this class with perf catcher, but this is another profiling tool giving you information about each rank. Uh, we can try this. I'm not sure we'll have time, but there is an SGI thing called perf boost. It will intercept other flavors of MPI and call MPT instead. So module load perf boost, and then I do a perf boost dash I MPI says the executable here is an Intel MPI compiled application, but it's going to call perf boost instead of Intel MPI, which will then call SGI's MPT instead of calling the Intel MPI. So simply a wrapper library compiled with other implementations that will call MPT for you. The other thing is profiling an MPI application. So here I did a module load of MPT, module load of MP inside, compiled it. Notice I had to include the library. And then I ran it cross host or cross partition, MP inside and then the name of the program. And what I get then is a stats file, and in here I'm basically looking at startup, receive and send overhead, barrier synchronization. So then I get a column here giving me for each CPU how much time it was in compute, thread startup, in sends or receive sends, and in a barrier. And then you get it by megabytes, not just time, and number of requests, number of packets to do this. MP inside, by the way, will work with other flavors of MPI as well. Now, MP inside can also get the hardware counters. That's why show event info and check events was actually available with the latest MP inside that comes out in May. Prior to that, it was in the perf suite utility, in the perf suite tarball. So I loaded MPT, loaded MP inside, checked what uh, 
a hardware counter I wanted to go, and then I did an NP inside PCL events equal, and then I listed the events that I wanted. So I did this perf count, data TOB misses, last level cache misses, uh, clock unhalted, and again, this might be different on your processor. These were hardware counters at the time. Then I did an MPI run, and now I can see for each CPU, this was the data TLB misses, this was the L3 cache misses, and this was the CPU cycle. I should be able to get up to 32 counters and look at them all at once. Again, the hard part is how do I correlate that into something human-friendly? What I really need to do is watch the clocks go down and then the event, the non-productive event go down. I always want to have cycles at the same time as I do anything else. I don't want to see the false cash sharing events go down, but the cycles go up. So we were talking about the hub. I reviewed this yesterday. We have a socket interface going to the quick path interconnect. This is a little similar to the UV2, but UV2 is just more. Uh, you've got two separate hubs, really, in the harp, one going to one socket, one going to the other socket. And then coming out of that harp, we have uh, 16 ports instead of four ports. Again, all of these pieces can be tracked statistically. So local home is about my cache coherency and directory memory information. Remote home is about cache coherency and intervention invalidations to remote nodes. Then we have the local block, which is my programming interface. So this is how the GRU is being used. We were looking at the MOE in that stack trace. It's also how I monitor with PCP or link stat or hub stat. It's also how UV dump gets its data. And by the way, there is an OLGRU diagnostic available that's usually not loaded that can stress and exercise this local block API. So the developer that worked on this chip had a whole bunch of test routines to check all the programming APIs available through the local block, and then that got integrated into a diagnostic. So there is a diagnostic to stress the uh, hub as well. So there is a hub stats command. Now in this case, I just did a sleep. I didn't really, we're looking at system-wide statistics. If I put my app under it or not, I'm still looking at the entire system. So in this case, I ran my program and then decided I want to look at things. So hub stats-c gave me statistics. I'm looking at local home, remote home, and NumaLink traffic, and then how much traffic in megabytes is on a per port basis. Again, I'll transmit and receives. I kind of look like to look at the transmits and the sends rather than the receives. Every transmit is going to be a receive somewhere else. Now, I had to do a link stat UV A to start things as well. And then with dash C, I can flip to other types of groupings. Let me go off to my desktop. So if I do a hub stat, the dash C, I can look at the other groups. So by default, we're looking at Numa link summary. But later, I am going to switch it over, for example, to look at the GRU traffic. Or maybe I want to start looking at directory memory or the snoop cache. And that would be more for uh, system engineers and kernel developers and stuff like that. So let me go back to the workbook there. So I can change the type of data that I want to look at. The GRU, hardware in the hub for memory to memory block transfers. But really, a lot of people call the GRU the, the local block API. The MOE offload engine is, is not just necessarily the block transfer engine. So there is uh, inter-processor interrupt synchronization hardware support, and some of the code and people still call that thing the GRU. So it's kind of a generic thing for the API to the hub. 
Now the GR used by MPT, Shamam, UPC, and you have to have XPC and XP MAM for it. And by the way, if I'm on a non-UV, if I'm on a ICE system or something without SGI software, you still need XP MAM loaded. This is just some of the RPMs, and again, there's a diagnostic for testing the GRU. So I want to get into this, but here I popped up PM chart, and I'm looking at the bandwidth total receives in this example, and then I'm also looking at the total transmits, the sends. So I've got the receives and the sends going on here. Again, as I mentioned before, they tend to look pretty close to each other, and these are... Uh, I think these are megabytes, yeah. Not they are not commands being sent, but this is payload data. So I want to get the demo and do that. Also again with MPI run dash stats, a, a dash verbose will tell me what environment variables are being set. And in particular when I have a GRU, I want to look for the GRU statistics. So notice in this example, I've got my bytes being sent via the GRU, and they're all point-to-point -point calls. So I had 379,000 requests sent with uh, 12, 124, 928 buffers passed between the ranks here. So there are some... Uh, First of all, load MPT, then do a man on MPI, and then you can look at these environment variable settings there. Again, tune for a single CPU first. Stride patterns, cache misses, POB misses, all that sort of stuff deal with first. Don't oversubscribe the machine or your barriers are going to stick. I was at one site a couple years ago. They were running Torque. People were submitting work into Torque, but then other people were logging in interactive and stepping on the spaces that Torque was giving them. And that caused the barriers to stick. Uh, try to use iSend instead of Send. And with iSend, you've got a polling process. So you can sit there doing iSend, 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 and then come back and do a wait looking for a send being responded to with a receive coming back in. Critical for us to use CPU sets and page placement as well. Avoid some of the slow calls. I don't know anything about that really. Oops. Now there is also, I generally do not advise people to hard code straight into the global shared memory library. There are a couple of sites like NASA Ames that want this. This is what MPT is using underneath. But there is a man page in the GSM intro that allows me to get from one partition to another and through XPMEM directly address memory on a different host through the Numalink. These are just some of the routines that were in that uh, global shared memory library. Trouble is these are UV specific and they're not going to be portable. And I don't care about POSIX threads, we've already talked that. So I want to go to demo mode here, compile the application, profile it. I want to stick some barriers. I will look at MPT statistics. I want to play with some of the environment variables to get my retries down and my single copies up, and to use the GRU. Uh, I'm probably not going to bother right now for time reasons with MP inside to look at that, but I want to demo hub and G GRU statistics. And I would like to do an interpartition MPI. And if you're interested, I have a fractal generator, a Mandelbrot generator that is X11 based. I'd like to see if I can get that running. So let me get out of here. Okay, so let me just start off. Uh, in your job mix, it was called Code 6. When I named these codes, I didn't want the name to give away what type of application it was. But in my other classes, I just called MPI Pong. It is a ping pong test. This is pure communication, 
There is no computational work to this thing at all. So I'm including MPI.h. I then do my MPI init that will spawn things. I figure out what rank I am. I figure out how many ranks were spawned. And if I'm zero, I'm going to print out a header. And then I'm going to determine a message size, sit on a barrier for everything, start a accounting counter, and then if I'm zero, I'm going to do a send and wait for the receive. If I'm a slave and not zero, I'm going to go into a receive, wait for the send to come in, and then respond back to that thing. So this is my ping pong test. It's pure communication overhead. The only computational work it does is right here, where it's computing the latency, the bandwidth, and then printing that out. And then we end with MPI finalize. Now, this is not a very good application example. It has problems with it, the master-slave behavior. By the way, something that I should add in here We also have another RPM in here called MPI test underscore MPT. This will also do benchmark timings, unsends, receives, ping pong tests, things like that. This used to be known as the PALAS, P-A-L-L-A-S benchmark. Then it became the Intel MPI benchmark or IMB. But SGI has taken that Intel MPI benchmark and built it against MPT. So this is another good, without that ping pong that I'm giving you, this is a good one here that has broadcast, bisection bandwidth, latency, bandwidth test, things of that sort, multiple host latency, a variety of uh, benchmarks that you can run. Any questions? So let me just start off. I don't need the Intel compiler right now. This is pure communication overhead, no computational work. So Intel optimization is not going to make any difference at all for me here. So I'm going to do GCC, MPI Pong, C, and it's complaining, no MPI.h. So let me do a module load MPT. Now let me try compiling it. <coughs> and this time it didn't complain about the MPI.h, but it complained about libraries not being there. So now I'm going to add in a dash L MPI. And now I successfully got my program running. Now RPM dash QL on SGI underscore MPT. Most Intel or most flavors of MPI provide their own wrapper. So I've got an MPI CC, an MPI F90, that sort of thing. By the way, this is new. i got to remember to try that. MPT underscore backtrace is going to figure out the PIDs of the ranks from the application. You kind of do MPT uh, process name, it gets the PIDs and attached attaches a GDB to each of the threads and does a backtrace on them. So anyways, I could have done this with an MPI CC and compiled, but I just chose to show you the worst scenario where, first of all, I can't find the include, second of all, I can't find the libraries. So I got that A dot out. Now let me run it. And it says, oops. A dot out. Uh, it's kind of interesting here. It's telling me that the MPI exec must be used to launch all MPI applications. Now, MPI exec underscore MPT is a wrapper when you've got PBS running, and I got M PBS loaded and running on this system. So I'm not sure if it figured that out and printed that out. Normally, I would have just seen an MPI run must be used. 
That looks like a, a change in the latest MPT that I'm working with. RPM-QA, perhaps MPT, uh, let's see, 2.8. That's the one that's currently being tested at NASA Ames as of this week for some problems. Uh, uh, there are, by the way, that the MPT might be released or available to you before the actual performance suite. Sometimes it's available as a download before you actually get to uh, the next performance suite release, which right now is six months apart. Okay, so let me try this now, MPI run dash NP2 dot slash A dot out. Even though I said use MPI exec, I'm not in an MPT in, or in, in a uh, PBS environment. By the way, that should also work with Torque. That thing is a wrapper to make sure that when I spawn work, I do not go outside the host that PBS has given me. Keeps me fenced in. So I need to start writing some numbers down here. So this is my starting point with the MPI run. The first field is the size of the message. So once I get past, for example, a 64K byte, once I get to 64K byte, I start seeing my latency jump, but I'm also seeing my bandwidth go up. This is kind of my Ferrari school bus 747. If it fits and it's small, you're going to be latency sensitive and latency driven. If it's large, then you're going to be bandwidth driven. I also tell people if you're moving a terabyte of data around, don't do it a byte at a time. So if I have large chunks, I'm going to get more bandwidth out of it. But I also have a latency increase. So I'm just, I've got a piece of paper here. I'm just going to make a note here. I'm at point, I'm two threads wide. I'm at a 0.4 to a uh, 392 microsecond latency. And then uh, I don't really care about the bandwidth on the low end, but the bandwidth on the high end, I'm getting to 5340 megabytes as a, as a bandwidth. Any questions right now? Also want to try a dash staff. And then a dash prefix, uh, quote, percent G colon space, quote. And now when this thing is done, I can see a report for every thread or rank that I had. And this is a little bit newer now these days than what was in the workbook. So there are some new fields that are in here. But I'm not seeing any retries right now. There are no retries here. Imagine looking at 40, 96 of these reports, or even worse, when you're going thousands of ranks across a cluster. Now, it looks like all of my data is being sent shared memory in point-to-point -point calls. Here's the number of bytes transferred in point-to-point -point calls. I see no single copy, and I see nothing for the GRU. Okay, now uh, let me do a couple other things first of all. Export MPI underscore verbose to, this has to exist. Let me try running this again. Didn't give me a whole lot on that one. Showing me the interconnect that it's using. Let me try a couple other here. Let me try the verbose one as well, make that one set. We had a little bit more at the top here now. So with that one, I can see the flavor of the libraries using the GRU, things of that sort. This, by the way, is what the latest version that is going out right now is dealing with. There's some bugs in that area using huge pages. Purpose of a huge page is instead of a 4K byte to get to 2 megabyte, that reduced TLB misses. Okay. Now, I'm on a 32 CPU system, so let me go start upping this. 
And because I've got a whole bunch of data or strengths here, let me put it into a report. Uh, let me just call it RPT.1. While that's happening now, let me bring up my PCP. Now that's on Floyd 1. What am I on here? I am on Floyd 1. So here I can see my CP utilization is at 100%. Not sure, I was just wondering what this IOPS was here. My load average is going up to the 32 ranks that I've got running. Let's see if I got any memory. No real memory use. My shmem only went up to about 80 meg. That's nothing. So I don't have any trims. And here's my Numo link traffic, by the way. So I'm seeing the amount of traffic on each port. And right now it's just going up to 150 megabytes. These were the send bytes that I was looking at. Now let me take a look at that report, RPT.1. So we've got all the verbosity at the top. We're able to see the inner process communication. So some of these ranks are using Shamam, and some of them are using the GRU. Now my latency, so I had some numbers before, was at 0.2. So now I'm going to say, now that I've got 32 threads, I've just got a piece of paper here. I'm going from a 0.97 up to uh, 855. So my latency went up from 392 microseconds to 855 microseconds, and I'm still on the same machine using Shamem and the GRU. And my bandwidth also went down. In fact, it fell. So my bandwidth got up to about 34 and then fell back down to 25. So let me just write down 36. So we went from 5340 megabytes to 3600 megabytes. And now let me try grep for retries on that RPT.1. Not seeing any retries. Okay, good. Let's also try for single copy. And I'm not seeing anything go single copy here. Okay. Let's grep for GRU. And very, very little going through the GRU. Here we did have some that went GRU, but it was buffered. It was not single copy. Any other ranks that did that? So I can see a few others that sent their data through the GRU versus shared memory. We okay with that? Any questions right now? So let me do a man on MPI. A couple of things I want to play with here. I've got my baseline right now with the bandwidth going down and the latency going up. I'm just reading this new one here. I haven't seen that one before. Here's the buffer max that I was talking about, buffs per proc. Oh, here we are. This is the one I was looking for. Uh, back up here. MPI GRU buffer max controls the single copy criteria when using the GRU. If the size of this message is greater than this value, we'll try to send it directly between the process buffers and not use those intermediate buffers. Also, whether the GRU is enabled or not.
Here's that memory map off that I mentioned for debugging. By the way, this is how I can switch MPT from a spin barrier to a yield barrier. Now that wasn't working on older releases of MPT. Number of threads if we're in a hybrid situation. Uh, here we are, what I was looking for, MPI shared neighborhood. This defines the neighborhood size. MPI processes in the same neighborhood will communicate with shared memory. MPI processes in the same shepherd from different neighborhoods will communicate via the GRU. So if it's host, the neighborhood will contain all processes in a shepherd, otherwise on a blade or on a node, or a given group size. So what was the one I wanted? Uh, I gotta do this again. MPI GRU buffer max. Yeah, that's what I wanted. MPI GRU buffer max. So, we do a more RPT.1. There's going to be a point where I start needing a bandwidth. Uh, let me make it 512. Anything over 512 bytes, I'd like to do single copy transfers on. So let me do an export MPI underscore GRU underscore buffer underscore max. And let me make that 512. Now let's try running my program again. Take a look at what's going on here. So we can see the uh, MPI interconnect traffic going on here. We're not seeing the GRU yet. I can see my packet size is going up as my interconnect is going up. And that one's done. Let's just try a grep for single. That's what I was trying to go for here. And I am not seeing any bytes transferred single copy. Okay, let's try a couple other things here. I'm gonna go to a zero here. I also had an MPI buffer max. This was not working right for me last week, so I'm not sure what's going on yet. And also let me do a uh, MPI shared neighborhood export MPI underscore shared underscore neighborhood equals, uh, I think it was mem node. Let's check that. Yeah, shared neighborhood. There we are. Uh, it is uppercase here. I don't know if that's going to make a difference. Let me make it uppercase. Okay, now let's try running it again. I'm just going to step over that prior report. By the way, before we do that, though, do more on RPT.2. And I don't see any bandwidth improvement here. Not much latency improvement, but again, we're not getting any retries right now. And everything is going shared, shamem here. Let's try this again now. I'm just gonna step on top of that prior run.
Okay. Let's just do a more RPT.2. Ah, oh, my latency went up. How about my bandwidth? My bandwidth went up too. It did still fall down, but we were in the two to three. Right here is where we actually did start getting some payoff. Now let's grep GRU. And uh, am I getting single copy? I am getting some single copy for the GRU. Let's try a grep. Dash E G R U dash E single. Well, I'm not sure it's the way I want it, but let's try that again. Doggone it. So I can see some of them using single copy GRU point to point, some of the threads. Any questions right now? I want to grep for retries. I did see the latency go up. That's probably from using the GRU. I'm not seeing any retries here. Any questions right now? Now, one of the other things I want to do here is the hub stats command. This time, I want to flip the statistics I'm looking at from NumaLink summary to GRU memory traffic. Oops, I need to have a shepherd. That should be good enough. Now, once I flipped it to this for GRU statistics, my NumaLink statistics are no longer working. I can only look at one of those groups at a time. I can only look at one of these things at a time. So now, let me go file a, add a tab here, get into the GRU. File, new chart. So I want to go to the UV group. Again, on uh, UV2, there's a bug with the PCP SGI that won't allow this to work right. There is a fix for it. Uh, I wanted the GRU statistics. There's the bandwidth. Again, I can't plot everything at once. Uh, receive request, transmit request. This is what I figured I'd do not header, data. I need the data transmit request. Again, I can only see so much stuff, but I figure everything's going to start off with a transmit request. And just for the fun of it, let's do a uh, data receive request. Actually, I don't want it on that. I want it on a separate chart. So let's apply that and then get the second group there. I wanted the GRU bandwidth. I was trying to do receive requests, data receive requests. So no, my NumaLink, no data anymore. So that local block API to the hub, Hubstats has gone into it and changed it. Let me do this a little bit differently. So now 
now when I look at it, the GRU statistics are gone, and the NumaLink statistics have started up again. I can only look at one group at a time. Back in origin days, I could look at all the groups, and I kind of miss having only one group at a time. In other words, I can see NumaLink traffic, but I can't see cache coherency. I can't see interventions or invalidations, and I'd like to be able to see that sort of stuff. So let me flip this back now to the GRU statistics. Now let me run this application here. There we are. Let me go into uh, three with this one. And now I can start to see my GRU traffic. Application's 100% busy. Memory's all free. No trims going on. I have no NumaLink traffic available to me now, but I can see the GRU, and in fact, we can see as the message sizes are going up that the data transferred on it. Notice the uh, receive request doesn't even show me anything. I'm just used to using transmit requests. So that shows the GRU actually being used. Now, whether it's a payoff or not is another story. Let's do a more on RPT.3. You can see the GRU being used quite a bit in here. Latency about the same, bandwidth still about the same. It is falling off still at 2 meg. And what do we got here? I'm just looking for retries and then the GRU single copy. So we still have quite a few bytes going buffer GRU versus single copy. Any questions? I'm going to go one step further now. So if I cat my ITSI nodes file, doesn't look like I have one in this machine. In there, I'm going to put in Floyd 1, Floyd 2, Floyd 3. Maybe I'll put in NASDAQ server, since that's my home directory within the cluster for everything. Now let me do a PMG cluster. And now I can see the three Floyds and my NASDAQ server in here. Unfortunately, I can't resize this or zoom or anything. And if I'm actually in PMG cluster, and I'm not sure this is going to work, middle mouse button, if I click on one of these objects, I get an info. And then it will give me what the colors are. Not always reliable. You have to be real close here. Let's see info, and I can see what CPU that is, for example. One thing I don't like is the way these things are laid out are by CPU number, but if I've got virtuals, then it's, I've got a whole bunch of physicals, and then I've got a whole bunch of virtuals, and I can't see it. Well, I've got some system time there. I can't see on a per job basis. It's kind of hard to see how a job got placed if they're scattered through these CPUs, where First half are physical and second half are logical. Okay. Now, I want to do multi-partition and then we'll take a break. So the first thing I'm going to do is mod probe XPC. And then let me do that to the other Floyds. Okay, now, hopefully that'll work. The other thing I should check, again, timing is sometimes a problem. I don't want to have to reboot anything right now. The other thing I need to check, HWCFG-A, to make sure that these are enabled, and in fact, they are both enabled. 
Okay, so I've got XPC loaded for cross partition, but I still have to configure the array services daemon to talk to these things. And if I take a look at the, uh, well, let me do it as a more. The only thing I have in there is my local host. And no remote. Now I have, there is a command with the MPT called array config that will build this, dash M to make the array configuration files, dash A to name the array, I'm going to call it Floyd, dash capital A for the authentication, I'm going to go with the simple RSA key, so that's authentication. And I should mention this now, I did not before. There are two versions of Array D. One is using a secure SSL socket. This Array config and Array D is not. So they can still snoop socket traffic and stuff. I'm going to put in a capital D, which will SCP the files across the host that I specify, and now I'm going to specify the host. So this is going to build my array config. Yes, I want to overwrite. Yes, I'm going to overwrite. And now for each of the hosts, it's going to copy the file out there. Boy, 3 has got a load problem. Still having troubles with. No, oh, it didn't have. It didn't know about itself. Now there is an AS check command to check that the array service demons are talking to each other. But this is actually inaccurate. It's seeing the three Floyds but they actually have not, I don't think they've restarted yet. Unless something has changed with Array D, I generally have to restart Array D across the cluster. Let me not do that right now and see what happens. So now I've got that MPI run thing here. Let me get rid of all the statistics. And now I'm going to put in my host, Floyd1 comma Floyd 2, comma Floyd 3. Let's see if this works. Now that A dot out has to be on every, I've got to be in a common directory so it finds A dot out on every node. And it is working. So my XPCs were properly being loaded. Let's see if I've got something here. Where's my desktop? Uh, Oh, they're blue. That's what it is. I couldn't see them. But I can see the application, 888. There's more CPUs there. I can specify more threads on that particular host, but I'm not going to do it right now. And we do have the GRU being used here. But it's also going between the partitions. And I do have noise, particularly Floyd 3 has noise on it, and I may be banging against other things. Now, when this parallel rank group is talking to each other, some of them could be stragglers because of noise and loads that are going on across the cluster. It looks like my bandwidth is still up there. Waiting to see where my latency goes. And I can see all this traffic going on here. I'm going to do a couple more experiments like this, and then we'll take a break. And when we come back, okay, so latency. Uh, when I was just on a single host, my latency was 392. 
Then it went up to 855, but my latency see right now is at 806. My bandwidth originally was at 53, but then we got it up to like 36, and now we're in the uh, 47, 48 mega, uh, gigabyte, well, megabyte range, about 4 gig there. I want to do another one here, dash, 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 stats, dash, prefix. And let me redirect into a file. Oops, what happened here? Uh, it is a position sensitive problem. I don't like this. And every MPI command line is a little bit different in the syntax. There we are. Since this one isn't doing anything, I'm going to close that one. What I'm trying to look for here are uh, retries to see if we're getting any retries. I wish I had actually been able to see the output so we can see the message size is going up and see the stepladder effect going up. By the way, I don't like to do a stack bar on this one. I prefer to just have it a line plot. If I switch this to a stack bar, I don't consider that as useful. That's kind of an aggregate and stuff. But I, I just personally don't like that format. I think it's easier to interpret and see what's going on here in a normal line plot. Okay, let's try a grep of retry. And I'd say that this version of MPT has made some changes because I used to be able to get a lot more retries on a per host basis. But I'm not seeing any retry attempts in this example. So it looks like the uh, latest version of MPT is doing some good stuff there. What was my uh, statistics here? Uh, same sort of thing. Went up to about 47, then started falling off. Latency about the same. No real change in that experiment. Again, we already looked for retries with no retries showing visibly. And again, not everything is doing single copy GRU either. Okay. Any questions? Now for the fun of it. I have a Mandelbrot generator you can grab off a of SourceForge, a, uh, a 
I don't know if he's still with Cray. There was a Cray employee that wrote this a long time ago, and I still use it. Now, it's already compiled and everything. Let's just see if it runs. MPI run dash NP two threads Y dot slash MXP. Oops. Module. I expect this to fail too. Load MPT. Oh, it worked. Huh. Uh, normally, I don't have the uh, module command available when I've come in through the uh, desktop. It's not PAM aware or whatever. No, it, it's not executing the profile.d directory all the time. But anyways, it did find it here. So, And here we are. If you want to play with this one, same kind of, let's see what happened here. Let me try it again. You can grab an area and zoom down into it and look at it more closely. So this is another MPI application. And let's see what PCP was showing me during all of that. Where is it here? Can't really see it here. Let me just try to resize it. I'm not even seeing any of the work right now, a little bit right there. So let's make this wider now, more threads and more hosts. Let me go 32 threads wide. Zoom in here. Huh. I was expecting to see more CPU time from this thing. I'm on Floyd 1. There's Floyd 1. I don't know what's going on yet. Let me try it cross partition. Can't open the display from the others. Trying to get an authentication file. Not sure if this is going to help me right now. not run executable. Uh, so I got a couple of problems right now. So it found the executable, but it still had this display variable problem to it. <coughs> I'm not sure where I want to go with that anymore. Usually I don't have this display problem, but let me just leave that alone for now. Did I SSH dash capital X myself? By the way, I would normally see a .x authority file being set up here. It is there. Let's see what's in it. That's oh, binary. I can't tell what it is. Let's try this one last time. Oh, where am I? Oh, 
module load MPT. Yeah, I still have a display variable problem. Yeah, same sort of thing. I start to see the display for the master thread open, but then the other threads aren't finding my display variable. Okay, one last thing here. Get out of here. So I did MPI Pong test. I think I called it A dot out. Hmm. Uh, I don't know LDD on A dot out, by the way. Let's see what that tells me. So that was not an MPI application. That was the older uh, CO2 MP. So let me do a GCC dash O MPI Pong dash O3, I guess, dash G for symbol tables, dash L MPI MPI Pong dot C. Let's try. Uh, something else go wrong, had a trace pack happen. Huh. I'm just seeing what's going on here. A GRU send problem from one to another. I wonder if that's going to happen again. See if I can redirect that output. Same problem. Okay. Let me get out of here. So I'm in this directory here. Let's just try it here. MPI run, it's in my path. MPI run dash NP two dot slash MPI pong. Uh, could not execute. No such file or directory. Uh, I thought that's where I just compiled it, but let me just get rid of. No, I was. I think as in real, real WL. That's probably part of my problem. Okay, so that's running. Okay. Log into the machine. Bring up top, so 
I can see MPI Pongs are running. Machine is 100% busy. I see here everything is 100% busy. But we're actually not getting any work done. I do a perf top. Here's my barrier synchronization problem. All of this is for barrier synchronization. Now, let me try this again. There's the application. It's not even advancing at all. Let me break out of here. I'm going to exit out, come back in. load, MPT, not advancing at all. Okay, Let's get out of here, log in as guest. By the way, if I go to PCP, take a look here. It is 100% busy CPU utilization, and there is GRU traffic going on, but there, the program is not advancing at all. It's stuck on a barrier. Let's run this one, and notice that one's getting through. Not very good numbers because of the noise that's going on in here. So this time, let me do something else. That one's done. Let's break out of here. Let me go 20 threads here and 20 threads here. So off it goes, fire up this one. They are now both stuck. We have stuck the barrier by stepping in each other's space. I've overcommitted the CPUs. Let's go in and take a look at it. Oops. So I've now showed you an open MP barrier problem with a spin yield. Now I'm sticking on spin barriers instead of yield barriers. Okay, bring up top. So look, 100% busy. Wait here, wait, there we are. Wait, what's going on here? We still have some idle time in here, huh? Okay, not sure why. So I got a 32 CPU system. Bring up top again. First of all, I should check your LS dev CPU set. No unique CPU sets. Let me see what's going on here as well. Uh, one of the things you can do, by the way, a more of slash actually be better if I copy slash proc slash sked underscore debug. BI that thing. 
So this is going to go through each of the CPUs and look at the run queue. So here's CPU 0. It's got two MPI Pongs on it. MPI Pong, I've got two on everything. I don't know of a tool that will actually massage and make this thing easier to work with. I'd like one that would just show me the run queues on a per CPU basis, but I don't have the ability to get rid of all the other scheduler statistics. Okay, so here now are some CPUs that are idle. So I don't have very good pinning. I don't have very good isolation. Let me bring up VNC Viewer. My desktop's having a little problem. There we are. So looking at PMG Sys, I don't have very good. I've got uh, 12 CPUs that aren't even being used, and I've got 40 threads. By the way, what's that? MPT underscore BT going to do with MPI Pong module load MPT uh, what do we got here PS where's the MPI Pongs hmm I'm not sure what's going on here. Uh, that was just the host name or the process name. Uh, execution name. Hmm. Was it because I have a dot slash on it? Let's try that. No. So I'm not sure what's going on with that particular process. Let me check the... Uh, so if I do a GDB, let's just pick one of these. and then do a BT, a backtrace on it. So here's what the application was doing. It's a PMPI receive that it's sitting in. Remember, master's in a send and everyone else is in a receive. So it's sitting there waiting for receive. We're in a request wait, and then we're sitting there waiting on this progress thing and shared progress, and here's where it's actually trying to figure out whether to use the GRU or not. And then this thing is actually in a hyperthread pause now, huh? Not used to seeing that one. And then if I do a, a perf record dash G dash P two four O three eight. Just letting it go for a minute or two. Take a look at that thing now. So there again, the top routine, SGI shared progress. Let me do an E on this, and it's all user time. So that thing is your barrier synchronization in a spin situation. So I can see MPI Pong called uh, 
SGI shared progress. There's some sort of cash info that's being initialized. And just a little bit of everything. But most of it, again, was this top one here, which was the SGI shared progress library. So that is a stuck barrier. Again, if I do a per top, all my time is in the MPI libraries. None of it is in computation. Again, this program has no computation to it. So there was my other one here. I need to move this stuff into CPU set and D place, but there's my program. Let me just abort this one, and the other one takes off now. <clears throat> I'm ready for a break here. I want to take a 15-minute break. Let's come back at 20 minutes to the hour. That's about 18 minutes by my clock. So I'll come back at 20 minutes 2, and then I want to do the NUMA module. Okay? So we'll see in about 18 minutes. <laughs> 